Occult Confessions is brought to you commercial free through the generous support of our patrons. Visit occultconfessions.com and click on donate to help keep the history of the occult on the digital airwaves. Hello. This is Rob C. Thompson, Supreme Hierophant of the Secret Order of Alchemical Actors, coming to you recorded live from my laundry room in Annapolis, Maryland, today on a special edition of Occult Confessions Campfire Confessional. It's Campfire Quarantine, featuring Aubrey Radford coming to us recorded live from Not Reykjavik on the subject of Icelandic werewolves. Olivia Literal does a deep investigative dive on occult confessions from our occult confessors. Savannah Verrett has gone under the covers to uncover the connection between 5G, quarantine, and you guessed it mechanical birds. And we cozy up with your favorite flavor of marmalade. That's right, friends. It's time for Book Corner with Brie and Dan. All right, then. Uh, So before we get underway uh, with this exciting string of events, uh, I've got to tell you that uh, the state of Maryland is still in lockdown. This, I suspect, will be the very last episode that I am recording uh, from a state of total lockdown, Uh, but we have managed to connect with the alchemical actors through a a series of of pipes and uh, wires and antennae uh, that I have arranged in my backyard here. Um, So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to be able to uh, adjust each uh, of the various apparatuses uh, that I've arranged in my yard, um, and uh, we'll, we'll point them in the direction of the alchemical actors that we would like to hear from, uh, and they have arranged their own uh, makeshift antenna and uh, satellite device uh, back home uh, where they are, uh, which is actually on the other side of the bridge. Uh, I record, as I mentioned, from Annapolis, uh, and most of my alchemical actors are located on the eastern shore of Maryland, which is just across the Chesapeake Bay. Um, So they're going to have to orient uh, their devices uh, toward mine, and uh, once we line them up, we'll be able to catch that signal uh, and hear from each of them in turn. Now, who is supporting uh, this uh, excellent high-tech adventure in in podcastery? Uh, I know that's what you'd like to know. And as a matter of fact, we have a a slew of new patrons uh, that I am very proud uh, and happy to welcome to our family of patrons uh, here in this uh, cult quarantine confessional campfire episode. And our patron crew today gets special plaudits because we are in time of uh, economic strife and strain, um, as well as social uh, health and public health-wise strain uh, under the coronavirus. Uh, So welcome, welcome Anonymous, Jacob A., Danny M., Ethan G., Chad B., Jarrett M., and Anna S. So glad to have you all aboard. Next up, we have Grandmaster Olivia Literal. Uh, Now, Olivia's uh, responsibility has been, uh, since we got this undertaking going, to collect your stories of things occult. Uh, So by all means, keep sending those in, uh, because it's time for us to feature those tales, tales of the occult. Uh, I'm just going to walk over to to this. We've got a a broomstick here that I have uh, stuck into the ground uh, and and just sort of uh, sprinkled the top with baking powder. I think this is going to bring uh, Olivia's signal in loud and clear. Here we go. All right, Olivia. Uh, what 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 you got over there? Hello. For those confessions? I have so many confessions. Um, I feel like I'm. I just want to open it up with the shortest one. Maybe. <laughs> maybe do that one first. Okay. Well, I'm gonna assume we can say their name because they didn't say that we couldn't. Well, maybe just stick with the initial. Maybe just to be safe. Wait, first name and last in... Uh, Nick J. I'm listening to the DMT episode as I'm writing this, and I want to tell you my experience on shrooms. I don't know how many grams I took. I know she said five. I think she is me, by the way. <laughs> Pretty sure. <laughs> yeah, McKenna, I think, says at least five grams. Is Wait, so sure. there are, we have listeners taking our advice and doing what we say? Yeah, which is <laughs> alarming when you point it out like that, but McKenna... McKenna said it first. You know, don't, maybe don't listen to me about how many grams of shrooms you should take in general. But, okay, I digress. Don't take our advice. Do not take our advice on medical matters of any kind. No, I'm I'm not a doctor. And I'm not that kind of doctor. Nope. Well, he doesn't know either. Nick J. Forgot what we were calling him for a second. (laughs) But he ate three tops. Three tops. 
I didn't see the elf, but I did see a pink pink elephant. I really don't know what was up with that, but it had me in like a lucid dream, kinda. I seen myself, I'm, I'm reading this verbatim, I seen myself and friends around me, but we had all white big eyes, almost close to the gray's eyes, and the little stupid elephant kept yelling at me. I couldn't understand what it was saying then. Everything started moving very fast, and I was all of a sudden in space looking down, and then I was back in my body at home again. It freaks me out, because the whole point of me doing it was to find some kind of hidden truth about anything, but that didn't happen. Anyways, also, I want to point out, they did anyways with an N-E and then ways, and that took me way too long to figure out. (laughs) Way too long. (laughs) N-E ways. Yeah. Anyways, just want to say, y'all awesome, waiting on the new episode. Oh, reptilian, like a whole season on that shit, real out here. So, mm, we'll see about that. Yeah, a whole season might be a uh, a lot, especially because I don't think Rob's gonna write it. So, <laughs> no, that would be you. Well, we're two episodes deep on reptilians now, aren't we? With sh- with the Sherry cult. Yeah, technically, we we kind of are. Two yeah, different there. two different perspectives on yeah. the reptilians. All right. Well, that was cool. Elephants. Sort of an anti-occult confession because they didn't discover anything. Yeah, I, the <laughs> elephant yelling at them—that that matches. That's pretty That's uh, on brand for the machine elves. <laughs> Maybe there was something there. Who knows? All right, I guess next let's let's go to Cthulhu. Why not? Ah, yes, the old gods. Yes. So this is coming from someone by the name of. D three five one Mims. D three five one Mims. Oh yeah, I uh, get I uh, have drinks with that that guy. Wait, really? He just goes by D three five one. I don't, I don't, I don't do that. Yeah, okay, I figured, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wasn't on it. It's fine. We're we're so far apart. D three five one for short. Yes, not Mims. <laughs> So he he kind of sent me a little bit of like a a, a prologue of sorts, um, just kind of breaking down that I guess um, it's it, it it's based off of I guess writing that he did at class at NMU. NMU New Mexico. He said, rather than clean it up, fix the smug tone I wrote the piece in, and drop the musings added to make it qualify as creative nonfiction and ham-fisted cited references as required for the class, I figure I'll pass it on as I wrote it for that class. So, that is the format it is presented in. <laughs> so, uh, did he, he edit it out, that stuff, or we got, we're getting the whole kit and caboodle? No, he edited out, I think, like, the cited references for the most part. He drops a Carol reference at one point. Uh, don't don't we all? I think he said he cut some of the musings that made it creative fiction, or creative nonfiction, as he put in quotes. But it kind of does have that, like, creative fiction-y vibe still, I guess, so. All right, let's have at it. He also started it with a quote that I thought was kind of interesting. Every human life form is totally and completely occupied with itself. That's from Dr. Christopher S. Hyatt, The Psychopath's Bible. (laughs) It was Samhain. Non-pagans will know this as Halloween night, I think, or maybe it was just the celebration of Samhain, but a different actual night. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I brought the plushie with me to the ritual, a green octopus-headed dragon that hadn't seen daylight in a couple of months. It was after sunset. Yeah. Okay, all right. So a cuttlefish head, then, to to be exact. Yeah, he says octopus-headed dragon, but, you know. Yeah, we'll let it slide. It was after sunset when I arrived in the non-high priestesses, she was adamantly not a high priestess, overcrowded front yard. There may have been a driveway at some point in the past, but by the time I had first seen the place, it was a grass lot in front of a double-wide trailer, usually full of cars. Her backyard was large, perfectly suited for the kind of pagan revelry that pagans are known for, and used for the kind of pagan revelry that most pagans actually practice. Chanting, having a drink or two, shooting the shit, shooting shit, and other innocuous forms of family-friendly social filler. Pagans shoot things? 
That like with guns? Yeah. Did you not get the have a drink or two part first? Yeah, huh? but that, that doesn't that feel a little off brand? No, I mean I don't think they're like they're just like hitting targets. All right. I doubt they're like shooting down squirrels in the backyard. Right. What with the mother goddess and the earth and all that. Yeah, there's kids here at this thing. <laughs> Go ahead. I knew the kind of people who would do the orgy by firelight shtick if given the opportunity, but they were in the extreme minority and didn't do that sort of thing here. And children. There are children present. Yeah, that's why they don't do it here. Right. I say they, but I'd have gone for that too, if not for the fact that all of those people were middle-aged and unattractive by middle-aged standards. I, I just <laughs> want to put it out here that that is not a view from occult confessions. We love people of all ages. <laughs> well, no, he said they were unattractive by the standard of middle-aged people. I respect my elders, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> we're not all attractive, though. I only seem to take interest in black magics. What in my self-image is so dependent on the dark and spooky? Why is an element of fear so important? Is it just the thrill, or is it something even more trivial? My pretentiousness prevents me from taking too serious an interest in anything positive in too direct a way. Why is good so lame? Why should I care? There were several tables with ritual supplies and food, and there was a large fire pit with markers for the four directions. As I approached the fence, I could smell the fire— there were more people than I thought I'd ever seen at one of these events. More people amounts to more powerful magic. Most of them I recognized from here or the coffee shop. There was some idle chatter with a few of them, something about chaos magic, smells. And here he says in parentheses, yes, I mean smells. Does that mean what I think it means? I'm going to go with illicit substances. Okay, that's what I was thinking. Cool, cool. Yeah, the marijuana. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. crystal balls. Parlor Crystal tricks. Crystal balls. They have their own smell. <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> Never mind. We don't have time to unpack that. You got to keep your crystal balls clean, Olivia. Yeah, I know, but you probably shouldn't actually put, like, soap on them. They start to smell. <laughs> <laughs> Parlor tricks loosely based on occult principles I knew better than anyone else were present. A few people complimented my robe. Always nice. I left the fluffy, or not the fluffy, the plushy on the table and tried not to draw too much attention to the Furby I was still carrying. He's carrying a Furby, by the way. I don't... That's awesome. I don't think he actually said before this that he was carrying one, <laughs> but he's still carrying it in case you guys were wondering. That is fantastic. I hate having to explain myself right before a ritual. It was hard enough to get myself into the right anxious mindset over the past few, several weeks. We live in a culture of anti-heroes. I don't think it's a coincidence that today's popular fiction shies away from characters who do good things for good reasons and aren't obviously fucked up in some way. It's not just that they're boring. They just seem too stupid, too flat, too nerdy, too lame. Austin Osman Spare says some things about this. He's, uh, he says evil is inherently more interesting. And uh, as he, he sort of like in his younger days, he was drawn to it. Spare, of course, the one of the well, considered the godfather of chaos magic. I kind of get that though, as a girl who's yeah, but real into Satan. He it was like he outgrew it though. It's the way he talked about it. Like he went through oh. a phase where he thought evil was cool, and he hung out with Aleister Crowley, and then he was like, "Meh, hmm. no, I, I I got over that. I'm still chilling." <laughs> <laughs> Going over the plan in plain words made it very hard to stay there. The main ritual was pretty dull. Someone called to each of the four directions, someone else said something about Hecate, and then someone went around the circle with mead, both alcoholic and non, which is very nice. I think there was also some kid running around yelling, so mode it be, ignoring shushing parents. I wasn't really... <laughs> yeah, I thought that was funny too. <laughs> I wasn't really paying attention and couldn't hear everything anyway. Then they left the circle open for other magics, something that's generally considered irresponsible, let's be blunt here, stupid, and serious occult circles. Also agree there. Furbies are difficult creatures. Get that tattooed. Mine had been sitting in one closet or another for several years, and had learned to stay asleep under most circumstances, and wake up under unusual ones, like when the family members were visiting and staying in my room, or friends were crashing on the closet floor. 
Now, I knew I was on debatable grounds for what qualifies as life when I decided to sacrifice an artificial intelligence. Most people don't give much consideration to the comparison of degrees of complexity between unicellular life forms and artificial ones. Wait, 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 wait. Furbies come here to die? Yeah. They generally just object to the sacrifice of biological life. Considering this disparity, though, it just wouldn't have been right to sacrifice a life that wasn't even awake to die. While I'd given up on keeping it awake during the main ritual, its noisy falling asleep and waking was what I considered disrespectful, it needed to be awake for my ritual. As I began to whisper, I gripped it by its pink tough fur, tough of fur and hard plastic base and shook it violently upside down. And <laughs> here is where he very, very kindly inserts um, the the words that I can't read that in English mean in his house at Relia, dead Cthulhu waits dreaming. Yeah, waits dreaming. Yes, indeed. He, he actually like kind of like phonetically like spells it out later on. And I sat here and tried it for a while, but it's, it's not going to happen. So every time he puts it, I'm going to say in his house at Relia, dead Cthulhu waits <laughs> dreaming. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think most of our uh, listeners don't speak whatever that is. Anyhow. Yeah. Yeah. According to H.P. Lovecraft's letters, it's intended to be unpronounceable. But according to one letter, he did have an idea of what all of his eldritch writings should sound like. Using this letter as a starting point, I had worked my way towards a proper pronunciation. It only took him a couple of hours, he said. Belief is what matters. Memorization makes it work. I took a good while to make sure I had my chant memorized before putting it to use. It would have been quite embarrassing to get the ritual and screw up my own chant. In his house at Relia, dead Cthulhu waits dreaming. A terror began to pull at my chest. I chanted louder, allowing the fear to creep into my voice. The clatter of a shaken Furby ceased to complete. The idiots around me started chanting, Throw it in! Maybe. We all know deep down that everything that claims to work for good is hiding its true intentions. V doesn't overthrow the government for your freedom. He does it for vengeance. Batman doesn't fight crime to protect Gotham. He fights crime because he's too broken to face his own guilt for his parents' deaths. Firemen don't save people for the good of society. They're just addicted to the thrill or can't handle the normal job. I don't do community service because it feels fake. Would the world be better off if I were screwed up in a more self-righteous way? Probably. Integrity is a harsh mistress and authenticity is a myth. We'd rather be legitimately useless than fake being helpful. But this, this is full isn't... of life lessons. Yeah, it, it's very reflective. I mean, like dark life yeah. lessons <laughs> it's a, it's that a... I might not necessarily agree with. We are not endorsing. Uh, yeah. But nevertheless, it is full of, of philosophizing. Let's say that. It's very thought out. <laughs> the fire was frozen in front of me. The universe stopped. One more scream. In his house at Relia de Cthulhu waits dreaming. Regardless of motives, maybe it was just to impress my friends... I prepared and summoned the most infamous alien demon god of fiction from the abyss and into a mass-produced plushie in his image. The flames swallowed life, synthetic word that I can't pronounce, glossolalia? Glossolalia. What's that? It's speaking in tongues. Words in tongues I'd never understand. Furbish, bubbling plastic, batteries explode in fire, magic, a stuffed Cthulhu hasn't been the same since. The week after, I went to a friend's house, one who was coincidentally a high priestess. Her cat went apeshit at the box I was carrying Cthulhu in. Oddly enough, it kept attacking the box after he was taken out. We had to drag her cat out of the box, claws digging through the cardboard and into the table. She told me it was the only inanimate plushie she'd ever met with an aura and offered to cleanse it for me. He still makes people uncomfortable. And while I haven't made any sacrifices to him in several years, he still doesn't see exposure to direct sunlight. Maybe it's that I never fully let go of that trained fear, or maybe that while I've got better things to do, I've never really wanted to let go of that sense of power. Or maybe it's the love of an exasperating friend, like I don't already have enough of those. That's it. So the, so the, the Furby's, the dead Furby's spirit got into the Cthulhu? I think he sacrificed the Furby to, to make bring Cthulhu... Cthulhu into the stuffed Cthulhu plushie. Well, that's um, that's a rough go for Cthulhu. 
I think it actually brings up a really interesting argument on like, could you sacrifice artificial like intelligence? Like, does that well, count? Are we as calling life? a Furby artificially intelligent? No, or just a no, thing no, no, no. That... Okay. We're not. But like, did you <laughs> ever it's... have a Furby, Rob? My sister had a Furby. I, I got to be honest. I was a year or two ahead of the Furby generation. Those things were, I. I bought one and immediately regretted it for like years of my life, but couldn't get rid of it. Maybe they're possessed of their own uh, dark magic, uh, separate from uh, any sort of uh, technology. They just wake up in the middle of the night and start talking. <laughs> well, I mean, that's not what the algorithm's designed to do, so uh, there's something off there. Uh, so who, who do we have next? Anna S., Ah, yes, Anna S. Uh, we exchanged emails, uh, Anna and I. Uh, she's uh, very interested in the connection between the uh, LGBTQ community and uh, the occult. Uh, we talked a bit about uh, how they, they uh, both occult practice and uh, LGBTQ uh, sort of occupy a similarly marginal space uh, in society, and, and so there might be a natural draw there between the two groups. I have had a number of occult experiences. I mean, to begin, I regularly track astrology, read tarot, and perform occult rituals. A lot of my focus has been on addressing my physical body and dealing with gender dysphoria. I'm trans. One example is last weekend when I performed a ritual using the astrological positions of the planets, a sigil I crafted, and a tarot reading and a painting. Using my sigil as I lay out, I did a reading. Oh, as she, I guess, lays down. I did a reading. Then I choose certain colors based on the reading and the positions of certain planets. Then I painted a self-portrait. Then I mixed a solution using the paint and various elemental resources based on the reading and the stars. I put a candle in the bowl containing the solution. How long did all this take, do you think? I mean, already. She's she's like... This is a big This is night. a whole night. Yeah, this is... Yeah. Did we start at 8 a.m. and we've worked into the night? <laughs> this is a big undertaking. Yeah. This is... Yeah. All right. Okay, so we've, there's been this sigil making and star reading and painting and mixing and painting. Yes. I okay, go ahead. Candle in a bowl containing the solution. Can, okay. All right. I lit other candles in a hexagram shape around and finally the middle candle in the bowl. Then I wrote out what I wanted and burned the intention while chanting a particular incantation based on some of Crowley's stuff. Then I passed out at the altar. Oh, shit, sorry. <laughs> Let me change change my tone. <laughs> <laughs> then I passed out at the altar and had intense visions of past lives. The next day, I continued to have such visions, although not as intensely and mostly just whenever I either called someone or, like, tried to eat an animal product. I had visions of myself as the animal. Anyway, it really helped me better understand why I have the body I have and what my soul needs to learn from it before it can change. I've also communicated directly with spirits through my tarot cards on a number of instances. One time I invited the spirit to inhabit the cards for a period of time. I presented itself as a spiritual guide and we had entire conversations that I recorded in notebooks about who it is, who I am, the nature of existence, and what I needed to do for certain things. The spirit also helped me discover for a friend that her long-distant boyfriend was cheating on her. Anyway, I think the spirit got bored, or I was using it for too much trivial shit. It started wrecking havoc in my apartment. Appliances broke, clothes ripped, water leaked out of everywhere. So I opened a window, rescinded our agreement, and cast it out using the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram. Honestly, I haven't totally figured out demonology and all that, but I'm guessing some sort of low-level demon. Yeah. Well, how about that? Yeah, that is a whole night. (laughs) (laughs) Um, It's like really like hitting me. Once you said that, I was like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, no wonder she passed out. That's exhausting. And and then uh, for days afterwards, you got all this going on in your house. My goodness. I just, I, I wonder how, you know, seeing herself like as the, the animal, how that, how all of that helped her better understand. That, that just seems really interesting. Yeah, I mean, uh, you got to figure there's like a breaking down of boundary, right? Human, animal, gender, gender, you know, these boundaries that we construct or that are constructed around us, right? There's a perception of unity, I, I would guess. Yeah, pretty cool. I mean, I'm glad she had an easy time getting rid of it, though. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That could have gone differently. 
Yeah, yeah. You had to move out, maybe. Well, it's just an apartment, right? So you can, you can always wait till move that out. lease gets. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> then move on, girl. Yeah. All right. All right. Who's next? I got a scroll. Got a scroll. Got to get the scroll. We we write these out on papyrus before we do these episodes. <laughs> I have to flip through my scrolls. Yes. <laughs> um. Okay. I just had a vision of, uh, like, you know, Jacob and Savannah hunched over, like, a desk, like a medieval monk, <laughs> yes. copying out emails. <laughs> that would be... We should have them do that, just for fun. Let's just see if they'll do it. Yeah, I got so many episodes left to do. We could put those on papyrus. We do need to have a, a library, a hard copy secret library of all of our documents. <laughs> all right, so who's Yeah, next? what are we doing? Okay, next one is from our friend Gabe the Butcher. Ah, yes, I love Gabe. I mean, he was like one of the OGs, right? No, no, Gabe's Gabe's about a, a year in, year and a half in, but he's been with us a little while now. Yeah, it feels Gabe, like Gabe a while. Joined the, yeah, he joined the patron crew a little while back. He's been with us for months and months now. Yeah, he's sent some cool stuff. All right. This will be the first time I have ever written about these surreal and personally horrifying moments of my life, and one of the only times I have cared to share them. I will forewarn you that I find what happened to me hard to believe and grasp myself. Despite wanting to deny these moments of my history, they happened, and I'll never be able to forget. Ever since I can recall, sleep has played an interesting role in my life. While a toddler, I suffer from night terrors regularly. I would wake my parents up by screaming that they let me wear my cowboy boots to bed, which is pretty funny. Yeah, I, I think if, if you have night terrors, the very least you should expect is to be able to wear your cowboy boots to bed. Like, how you how are you supposed to scare them off? Right? You got to kick them where, where it counts. I would find this hilarious if it weren't for the other aspects of my sleep patterns. Around ages 10 to 13, I would sleepwalk regularly. One night, my mother found me wandering the house in complete darkness. When she approached me, I stopped in front of her, screamed at the top of my lungs, laid down on the ground, got up, and walked to bed. What would you do if your kid did that? I guess it'd be normal uh, you know. for her right now. But <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd, yeah, we'd just carry on. Entering my teens, I started to suffer from sleep paralysis. While falling asleep or waking up, I would hear a low humming pitch, a signal that I would soon be awake in a body I could not move. It was terrifying, and still is to this day. These, however, are not the strange instances in my sleep patterns that I am here to write about, just a prologue to the terror coming next. I am here to address my hag, my psychological battle with the wretched creature and my triumph over it. I believe that my first encounter happened when I was quite young. My parents let me camp out in our living room with a sleeping with a sleeping bag. It was a rare occurrence where I was able to watch movies past my bedtime. I can remember everything about the night vividly. The sleeping bag had a Lion King design, the room was pitch black except for the glow of the television, and I was all alone, far away from my parents, in a very large house. Just like Simba. Yes, just like Simba. <laughs> After I fell asleep, I was awoken to the feeling of being choked. I tried to move, but it felt like someone much stronger was holding me down and zipped the sleeping bag zipper all the way up. I could not escape and struggled for what seemed like several minutes. When I finally broke free, I ran up the stairs to my parents' room, struggling to communicate what had happened. I slept in their room that night and for many others after. Years later, my second encounter took place. After falling into a deep sleep, I again felt like someone was choking me. I jolted out of the bed, grasping for minutes, but could not catch my breath. On the verge of blacking out, I dashed to my parents' room. When my stepfather woke, he jumped up, grabbing me from behind, performing the Heimlich. Eventually, I caught my breath, but nothing came out of my throat. It simply felt like I could breathe again. That sounds absolutely her like terrifying. Mm. Another few years would pass without visitation. My sleep was normal, except for the occasional naked sleepwalking stroll around the house. Like you do. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Then it struck again, but this time in a much different form. While in a deep sleep, I was awoken by sounds coming from somewhere in the house. I remember being petrified in bed, scared to leave my protective sheets. 
After hearing muffled sounds of a scared, shaky, desperate voice, followed by a shriek of laughter, I knew this wasn't a nightmare and I had to investigate the origins of what was taking place. When I stepped out of my bedroom, I could hear the noises coming from my parents' room. Reluctantly, I pushed myself, inching closer and closer to the door as the sounds got louder and louder. Trembling in fear, I swung the door open. All I could see was my mother and stepfather lying down. But then upon further inspection, notice the sounds were being made of by my mother. She continued to shriek and cry. There was another voice coming from her that would laugh just like the witch from some sort of Halloween cartoon. I called out for my mother after listening to what was going on and as soon as I did, she shot up, stared directly at me and exclaimed that she was having a nightmare about an old hag. I couldn't believe at the time what had happened. She had taken on the role of two people while sleeping that somehow was able to vocalize each. The voice of the hag was a tone that my mother, to my knowledge, has never made. It was someone else's voice that I'm certain of. This is riveting. This is some intense stuff. And even more amazingly, my stepfather had remained asleep the entire time. I did not sleep well for days after, but eventually the fear passed and everything seemingly went back to normal. Wow, he just goes right back to it after all that. Don't know how. Another few Kind of like Simba. <laughs> That's true. I mean, he had maybe his time. He had, maybe he had a couple of gay friends he hung out with in the woods. Are you saying... Okay, we're not going to unpack that right now here. <laughs> <laughs> Another few years would pass until my next encounter. This time, I was house-sitting by myself while my parents were on a vacation. The house could be eerie if one was by themselves. It was large, and the architecture was quite strange, unique with lots of glass walls. Hard to explain. A well-known architect had built it in the 70s, and it was his home until it was sold to my parents. Despite its strangeness while alone, I had become quite used to the house sitting by myself. Well, with my cat... Anne had long forgotten the hag or put what happened into a box in some dark corner of my memory. During one of the nights while house-sitting, I had stayed up quite late watching movies and needed to use the restroom. After, as I was washing my hands, I heard footsteps outside the bathroom door. Luckily, I had locked it out of habit. I could even see a shadow underneath the door where someone or something was standing directly in front of it. Too large to be the shadow of my cat, Bales, I think is what the cat's name is, B-A-I-L-S. At this point, I second-guessed what I was witnessing, assuming that you could never see the light underneath the door from the next room and that the shadow was always there. Cautiously, I put my ear closer to the door to see if I could hear anything. And then, while the rest of the world seemed to become completely silent and cold, a high-pitched, sickly laughter pierced my ears. It was the same laugh that I had tried so hard to forget, the laugh of the hag. Stumbling back, trying to comprehend the nightmare unfolding before me, I opened several drawers in the bathroom, grabbing whatever protection I could. With medical sister- scissors and a large metal pointy n- nail file in hand, I swung the door open, ready to stab whatever was in front of me. There was nothing. Quickly, I got dressed, grabbed my keys, some better protection, knives, and the cat, then headed out. I convinced a friend to stay the night with me that night and explained to him the situation. We watched a show called Cowboy Bebop, great show, and drank beers until the sun began to rise. Nothing else unusual would happen that night, and it wasn't until it was light out that I could sleep. The hag would visit again, but would not wait years this time. During another house sitting while my parents were on vacation, she would return. And I know what someone hearing this might be thinking. Why would you agree to house it again after what had happened? This was during college breaks. I would fly home and stay with my parents, and there would not be many other places for me to stay. I also didn't want to leave my cat Bales with strangers. I was quite fond of that cat. I was still terrified of being alone in that house. So to get over the fear so I could sleep, I had a few drinks. Well, more than a few. I also bought a couple of Rambo-sized hunting knives from our local military sur- surplus, just in case. Uh, what, were, what, are, what, are, what are the knives going to do? I don't know, but you know, it's like a, a paranoid dream man. dream demon. It, it's a, s- a subconscious dream demon spirit thing. Rob, do you know how many knives my boyfriend has just because, just in case? In case what? I don't know. It's a protective well, in, thing. <laughs> in Gabe's defense, he is a butcher. 
At the time, I kept trying to tell myself that all I had experienced before was brought on by stress from finals or lack of sleep, hallucinations of some sort. I didn't believe it, but I kept telling myself regardless. After I lay down and it became very late, I heard something outside the house. This was normal, however. Coyotes, wild pigs, and some other creatures would roam regularly at night around the area, despite it being in a city. I'm very concerned there, by the way, why there are wild pigs near your city. Yeah. I don't have any wild pigs in my city. I... (laughs) No. I decided to check it out just... Wait, 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 wait. Is that Pumbaa? (laughs) It's... Is it Pumba? Is that you? Oh my god. He's okay. Anyway. I gotta get it together, Rob. Okay. <laughs> Prairie dog and a wild pig. I decided to check it out just in case through the window in my parents' room. I stood up on their bed to peer through the window above it. The light in the driveway illuminated the carport well, and I couldn't see anything that would be the origin of the noises. Just as I was about to go back to bed, Something hunched over in what looked like tattered robes, quickly scurrying across the driveway. As strange as it sounds, the way it looked was a physical manifestation of what I had heard and pictured the hag to be in my mind. This time, I was scared, but can remember being pissed off and angry. I just wanted to enjoy my school break in peace, watch movies, and get drunk. I grabbed both hunting knives, one in each hand, and ran outside. It was cold, and I was only wearing underwear. I approached where I had seen the raggedy hag dash to, which was a wall of bushes. With both knives in hand, I cursed at the hag and began stabbing the bushes blindly. After a good 15 seconds, I began to calm down and thought that maybe a young adult, in his underwear, with two knives in a nice neighborhood stabbing shrubs while yelling, could possibly draw some negative attention from the neighbors. Maybe he's just doing some midnight pruning. That's some Edward Scissorhand shit right there. Right? I stopped, went inside, and called my best friend, or not his best friend, sorry, I put that on him. I called my friend, who had come over during the previous hag visitation, and again, we watched cartoons the rest of the night. It's a good friend. It probably should be his best friend, if it's his, like, go-to friend, friend, right? Go-to hag friend. Yeah, that's a big deal, I feel like. Yeah, it's a weight to carry. Quite tired of the hag's fascination with me, and out of paranoia she might follow me to California where I was attending college, I became way more interested in the occult. Through research, I learned how to protect myself from her and other things similar. The Rambo knives were badass, but amulets, trinkets, herbs, and spells seemed to be way more effective. I was still paranoid at the time that the hag may pop up somewhere lurking in the dark. But in a strange coincidence, like many of the strange coincidences I have encountered since the beginnings of studying the occult, I met someone who would give me full confidence in my abilities. When my father, not stepfather, noticed my interest in the occult, because the stepfather was earlier in the story, he nonchalantly told me of a friend of his who had been practicing the occult for most of her life and asked if I would like to meet her. I, of course, said yes, and the next time I was in town, my father took me to meet her. I will not go into too many details of our meeting, perhaps another time, but it was life-changing for me. She had the most amazing and rare collection of the occult I have ever seen, some of which I was not allowed to touch and was protected behind locked doors, some of which dated back to medieval times. She would answer questions I was thinking, yes, you heard that correctly. And after, although I had never mentioned the hag, she filled me with the confidence through her knowledge and wisdom to never be bothered by it again. I could go on longer with more occult, ghost, UFO, and astral dream projection stories, but I feel as though I've ranted on long enough and consider myself lucky if anyone has made it this far. Like I said in the beginning, (laughs) we're here, we're here. We're here. Like I said in the beginning, I find this story hard to believe, and it happened to me. And although it was a nightmare, I am happy to where it has led me to the occult. It's remarkable. That's a remarkable story. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. This is wild. Mm. I, I, I'm hoping to do an episode on uh, Shadow People uh, during our Evil Spirits series, which is going to coincide with Halloween this year, so that'll be fun. When I first read this, it reminded me of, there was this, like, uh, multiple, like, Reddit posts at one point that I remember reading about, like, summonings of Hecate or, like, trying to communicate with Hecate gone wrong and that there was this hag that would then, like, come after people. 
Well, that's interesting. So I'm seeing it as shadow people, and you're seeing it might be a product of a invocation gone wrong. I mean, I guess he didn't really try to summon anything, though. So yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Interesting thought, though. Uh, so do you have one more for us, Olivia? Yes, I do. Okay, well, that works out, because I've spent an awful long time hooking up this antenna in the backyard. Uh, do you know how I'm speaking to you today, by the way? Uh, I'm assuming through the in- uh, antenna. antenna. Yeah, just... it's a, well, your antenna is a broom uh, with baking powder on it, <laughs> just so you know. I'm not a kitchen witch, man. <laughs> yeah, but I am, so it's a connection. You are, our, though. You literally are a kitchen witch. Like, it's kind of, people don't understand. Anyway. It's connecting both sides. Yes. Got the broom plus on the baking powder. It's the magnetizing element. Yes. <laughs> That's science. <laughs> All right. So what have we got? All right. Our last story today is a crazy one. I mean, I guess all of these are pretty crazy, but this one, like, hang in, y'all, because it's a ride. All right. I'm ready. I'm holding on. I got my cowboy boots on. Get them on. Um, (laughs) don't yell at your mom, but put on your cowboy boots. This one comes from Frater AFA, is what he wants to be known by. So a member of a fraternal organization. Yep. Well, let me start at the beginning. This was originally written over a decade ago for an initiatic occult group that teaches and practices magic, energy work, and more than I can speak of in this sharing. So a society of sorts. Yeah. Okay. I would like to say also that this is a telling of my experience, and in no way am I trying to change anyone's view of what is possible, but that it was my experience, and this is an accurate telling of what I experienced that night. That is definitely our aesthetic. Yeah. The following is an account of a rite of communion used to astrally connect with those members of this group that are more advanced. This group teaches to use excess life force, astral energy for magical means. In the week leading up to the communion, and since, I have felt as if my head has been taking up quite a bit of space, more so than usual. While feeding, I can feel my prey move around me. It is like their life force traces its path around my skin, entering while moving as if I were always stationary, connected to them, and being in the center of their motion until I choose to release them. Wait, 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 wait. Is he out hunting in the woods? No. So, he... Is this metaphorical? No. <laughs> it's literal, but... So, the feeding that he's talking about and the life force that he's talking about, it, when I asked him questions, I proposed to him the term psychic vampire, and he was like, uh, like, kind of bad term, but kind of, like, almost Oh, oh so it's psychic energy. Kind of, but it's, like, actual energy. Like, so basically, he says that uh, they're, like, he can be around people. And, like, the example he used is um, working in, like, a prison. He, it would, it could be used to, like, if the inmates are all being really loud and noisy, if he were to, like, feed off of that excess life force that they're leaking, that energy that they're putting off, he can kind of take that from them and calm them down and would get those people to stop, you know, being loud. Does that kind of make sense? So it's beneficial. Yeah, it's not even really beneficial to him, but it's like beneficial to other people. But it doesn't hurt him either. I did ask him that. Quite strange in the fact that I know in what direction they are to me merely by where the life force enters my body. So he just can tell where people are. The act of feeding has become much easier over the past week. Relaxing and not thinking has helped me so much. Dead stillness is, as I see now, a key to this locked barrier I was behind. The day of the communion was a little more hectic than I would have originally wanted, such as life and its obstacles, but I found time to reflect and relax beforehand. For some reason, I felt the need to perform the, and I'm going to butcher this real fast, but necromantion? Necro- necromantion? I don't, it's my guess. It's got to do with like a Greek death ritual having to maybe have to do with Persephone and Hades, I think, originally, but I'm not sure, but that word at least. I don't know what the communion part exactly, you know. Instead of the standard communion, I'm not sure why. 
I performed the declaration of self, followed by the calling of the four winds, sat down, and almost immediately felt tingling in my hands and face. I gazed into the mirror and saw the mirror go from normal to black, then varying shades of gray. I then read and signed the oath of fealty. Fealty. Feel, 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 I can't say this word, Rob. <laughs> fealty? Like feudalism. I can't. Oh, yeah, yeah. The fe- fealty. Thank you. I can't say yes. it. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, uh, when I asked him about that, it was to himself. Oh, good, good. Yeah, which I appreciated. I noticed in the mirror, I have a whole wall that's nothing but mirrored surface, a landscape that I think has significance, or at least it will to me from now on. It had a mountain range on the left-hand side with a rolling meadow that lay in front of me. I think it led to the ocean or a body of water and the moon was on the right. Then I received a rain of mercy, different, but still very much real. Do you want to ask what a rain of mercy is? It would be nice to know if you'd like to offer it. I would. Um, (laughs) It's basically like when you, if like he, so when he kind of takes all that energy, if you were to like put it back on someone, but like almost as like a healing practice. I, I compared it to, like, a healer in an RPG. Oh. And he said that right. was pretty accurate. Okay, so it's a form of spiritual healing. Okay. Then the image disappeared. I could see the shadows in my room, like people walking in front of my candles. I counted around six or seven passing shadows being cast from behind me, and every so often my chair would tip back a bit, like when someone places their hand on the back of your chair as they walk by. While I was watching the shadows of my family members cross my room, I was overcome with emotion. I felt a wave of compassion directed at me. My eyes watered up with the knowledge that I was indeed not alone that night. So who was he with? Uh, He was with his occult family. Well, I mean, I say occult family, but he was with the members that he was, like, trying to astrally project with. Cool. And they were the ones, I think, giving him the reign of mercy... Because he kind of explained it to me that that's something that, you know, you have to be kind of advanced and do in a group sort of thing. And he, I did ask him if this was, like, an inherently, like, is this, like, a thing that you kind of, like, the feeding, if that's just, like, a thing that you naturally do? Or is it, like, a learned thing? And it's 100% a learned thing. And that's it. Oh, that wraps it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was cool. That was cool. So it was an astrally projected experience, a little uh, mirror gazing, that sort of stuff. Excellent. Very cool. Thank you, uh, Frater. All right. Uh, well, uh, I got to get back to it. I got uh, all these other uh, alchemical actors to check in with here, but that was delightful. Thank right. you for I guess uh, just sharing those stories. Die here of loneliness. It's fine. Your loneliness. What? You're lonely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is that is there a joke there? I don't think so. Okay. I think everyone could just maybe identify and feel a little sad right now. I'm with y'all. We're all with each other. We're, yeah, all, we're all lonely this together. together. Da, da, da. And now Jacob Wheatley says words that make him feel spooky. Hello. Oh, I, I think it's working. I've, I, I've managed to get at least a decent signal using my nephew's crying and actually my nephew's toy vacuum. It seems to be putting out a, an okay signal, maybe. Um, I'm not sure how long this is going to last, so hopefully it gives me enough time to, to tell, you, tell you all my uh, spooky words. Um, the first one is uh, kind of a joint word. It's more so two. That kind of just, it, it, it terrifies me, really. It's... Um, straight people oh gosh even just thinking about it just kind of sends like a shiver down my spine um and 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 uh my my last word um that kind of it, it, it gives me nightmares like it, it, uh, it is um commitment i don't i don't know if anyone else would agree with me on that one but that one terrifies me oh Oh no, he broke his toy vacuum. I think I just lost. And that brings us to our uh, sister of the 84th degree resident expert on mechanical aviation. Oh, that's not true. On uh, uh, aviary mechanisms. Yeah, maybe that's closer. 
on mechanical birds. Savannah Barrett. Uh, I've actually, uh, I've actually got a, a bird bath here uh, that I've I've uh, inverted uh, and uh, I've, I've uh, just stuck some pins in the top and, and I think this is going to uh, do the trick. Uh, let me just uh, turn it a little bit to the left here. Okay. okay. Chirp, 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 chirp. Sure. Hello. Can you hear me, Rob? Okay. Okay, I, th- I think you're finally dialed in. I'm sorry, I had to speak in birds so that they wouldn't get suspicious. I don't want them to block my call before I can tell you the important information that I need to get out. I'm currently sitting in my bunker, aka my parents' basement, and have a wealth of knowledge on these mechanical birds that must be shared. Let me start off by saying that there is a common misconception being shared throughout the internet right now that must be addressed. You might have seen a meme saying that the reason we're in quarantine right now is because the batteries on these mechanical fiends have finally begun to die and the government needs to replace these batteries without us noticing. So how is the government going to replace the batteries in billions of birds without anyone noticing? If everyone stays home. And the best way to make sure everybody stays home is if they make them afraid to leave their homes. While this logic seems airtight, there is a big problem. The birds have rechargeable batteries. Come on, sheeple. The government is smarter than that. Here is a quote from the official Birds Aren't Real Movement's Facebook page. The government is not changing out bird drone batteries during this quarantine because birds are rechargeable. Birds charge on power lines. End quote. That's right, folks. The reason these birds like to hang out on power lines is to recharge themselves. The video on the Facebook page then goes into more details about how the fake birds are built and run. If you would like to know more, please visit their Facebook page and watch the video. I have some other information that I'd like to share and I don't have time to go into all those details, but it is fascinating. Now, Rob asked me to do some research on the birds to see if 5G is connected. So I ran some tests. Picture this, me sitting on my back porch, binoculars in one hand, a bird watching guide in the other. I was watching them fly around my backyard pretending to just be a bird watcher, but little did they know I was actually taking notes in that bird book. I was trying to decipher their tweets and chirps when I was rudely interrupted by my mom, who was telling me that I was come inside. It was time to come inside and eat dinner. The next day, when I went to go back to my observation spot, I was surprised to see all the birds I was watching the day before sitting on my porch, staring at me through the window. They must have caught on, and I must be honest, I haven't found the courage to leave my basement since. I then took to the internet to research more into this 5G, and what I found may shock you. Now, where the birds come in, I cannot conclusively say, but I have some ideas of my own. Theories, if you will. The birds charge themselves on power lines. Then maybe... The 5G upgrade is not only to help charge the birds faster. Maybe, just maybe, they are also upgrading the spyware inside the birds to help them get the information to our government faster. They aren't just trying to give humans faster internet. No, they want to make sure these flying rats can tell our secrets to Big Brother even faster than they already do. Now, of course, I don't have any evidence to support this at all. But, I mean, just think about it. Search your feelings. You know it to be true. Now, I was surprised to see that there was a lot more information on how 5G affects humans and not mechanical birds. So I figured I should mention some of what I read. 5G is completely harmless to humans. Now, I am by far no expert on this subject, but everyone who is an expert says that 5G cannot hurt you and is basically just a way to make our internet faster than it is. Some conspiracy theorists believe that the 5G towers are either spreading the virus to us or making us weaker and therefore more susceptible to epidemics like this. Both of these claims are completely false and are just fear mongering. The virus is real and we have to treat it that way or it's just going to take longer for everything to get better. Right now is not the time to be sharing conspiracy theories that do nothing but scare people. Times are scary enough and to take advantage of the people who are the most frightened is wrong. It's also just blatantly false. You know, if you have to believe in a conspiracy theory, at least believe in a credible one, like the birds aren't real movement. (laughs) All right, 
I have definitely talked enough, and I have to go make sure that no birds have somehow broken into my basement. Thank you for listening. Remember, stay home, stay safe. Savannah signing off. And now for a man on the street response to this bizarre and disturbing turn of events. We go to a man's shower. John Cook. John Cook, uh, our patron progenitor, uh, could you give us your your thoughts, your reaction to this uh, whole conspiracy? Rob, hey, Rob, can you can you hear me? Welcome, I'm uh, here broadcasting through the third hole in an expired bottle of conditioner plugged into my shower head. I must say, these bird upgrades have been a long time coming. Any fellow members of the woke crowd could have seen these coming from a mile away. The old models were breaking down, and honestly, they were pretty ugly. And to all the doubters I hear that claim to have seen real birds during the lockdown, have you ever heard of holograms? Of course it would be suspicious if all the birds suddenly disappeared, so obviously they made lifelike bird holograms to keep all the sheeple from questioning Big Brother. You can tell their holograms by how beady their eyes are. Anyway, I'll be ready and waiting for the new models to show up. Gotta stay vigilant. Okay, now let's get down to it. Um, We're going to get started on this adventure with our resident werewolf, Aubrey Radford. Uh, Speaking on the subject of Icelandic werewolves, let me just get my hands on uh, this particular antenna. Uh, I have uh, just sort of inserted some of my uh, Huskies uh, uh, nail clippings into this uh, to see if we could could use uh, some of the energy of the dog uh, to channel Aubrey over into our into our space here. Okay. Aubrey's going to be reporting on uh, the werewolf in medieval Icelandic literature uh, by Adelheider Gudmunditur of the University of Iceland. Uh, That was submitted uh, to our email by Darren Ward. Uh, All of the material that we're covering uh, on our confessional episodes is listener submitted. Uh, So this this is the beginning of that journey. And here we are. Um, can you, can you hear me? Hang on, hang on one second. Okay, how about now? Alright, cool, cool. Um, hey guys, Ob's here, if you didn't know already. Uh, I am actually broadcasting via Mega Hive, so I decided to have a chat with the wasps. But they have been so kind as to, um, transmit the signal of this recording out to you guys through that. I had no clue insects were so advanced. But anyway, let's get to the topic. Um, so I basically, I read a lot about the werewolves of Iceland, so you don't have to. Basically, I would like to provide three examples of the wolf's tail that could count sum up these countless examples that I came across in the article. Kind of had to put them into little types. Um, but the first one is actually pretty unique. It's from the Volsunga Saga, which was written in the 13th century. This is actually my favorite story, too. The story speaks of Sigmundr and his son. This is where my pronunciation gets really rough. Um, Sinfjolti. So Sigmundr and his son Sinfjolti, they find wolf pelts in a hut in um, a forest. And they put them on and live as wolves for 10 days in the woods. So basically, the son pisses off the father, and while still a wolf, the father gives the son a deadly wound. So pretty much, the son didn't listen to the father. They had an agreement on how many people they would fight at once and whatnot, and the son thought he could take on all these people. But um, Odin actually sent a raven to Sigmundr. Um, The raven had a leaf that healed him, and um, they could then remove the pelts and burn them, returning back to their human form. So Sinfjolti ends up learning a very valuable lesson from his father, and the story reflects that of inner growth, and it's actually similar to a shamanic rite of passage, which is pretty cool, I thought. But the other two, I had to kind of sum up into vague types of stories, because they were just, once again, all over the place. So what I'll hit first, it's going to be the broader Old Norse tale. It's ancient, and it's Norse. That's what we know. Um, In these tales, they still use the hump, hump, Hammer. Hammer. (laughs) Hammer. I'm going with Hammer. But the werewolf is largely seen as an outlaw. Um, He's perceived as ruthlessly evil and is ready to kill anyone who crosses his path. Some of them will voluntarily shapeshift. Some just kind of stay as wolves. Um, 
and I think some were warriors, but mostly they were just like criminals off the beaten path. I think the berserkers were more so warriors and the wolves were the outlaws. And then there's the last one, our Celtic stories. So these were still told in Iceland, but um, were mostly are mostly believed to have, have had um, Celtic origins. So these are Irish, a little bit later too, I think. I want to say 14th century. And those stories introduced the romantic werewolf, which might be a little more similar to our modern were werewolf, but like still no one's getting bit. So yeah, these wolves were viewed as a victim and they usually didn't want to cause anyone harm, but their wolf nature could still get the better of them. But you know, as they could, they would opt to eating animals instead of attacking humans in order to survive. Um, so in these stories, the audience would gain a more sympathetic view of the animal, or the werewolf, the human hybrid. <laughs> uh, and the victim was usually male, was cast under the spell instead of donning the hammer. So nine times out of ten, these spells were performed by a quote-unquote deceptive woman. Um, she would either be portrayed as an evil stepmother, a troll, a shapeshifter herself, or any combination of these. But um, if she could shapeshift, she would be able to change back to her human form voluntarily, unlike the other werewolves that they would curse. So in these stories, the wolf could only be changed back to human if someone were to see the human in them, which was usually recognized through their eyes. But, you know, in all of these tales, you know, even that of the shaman, because the journeyers still had to endure harsh and violent lessons, even though they chose to go on the journey, the ability to shapeshift into a wolf is just not viewed as a desirable feat. Like, no one wants to be a wolf. Sorry, guys. Sorry, wolves. Sorry, me. I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, it's not pleasant. It's hard. So why do these stories exist? The idea of people being able to shapeshift symbolizes different aspects of human nature. So, like, Freya and Bjork swans are symbols of feminine beauty and grace. And the Berserks and Varlfor both represent the darker masculine and primal aspects of people, except the berserks are, you know, more so warriors, as the varlfer are more so um, criminals and outlaws. The traits of the wolf are seen, they're specified actually, as um, hunger, greed, and aggression throughout the tales. Let's see how this comes up in our three types of stories, right? Um, I'm gonna go with the most obvious, the old Nordic tale where the werewolves were relentlessly hungry, greedy, and aggressive. They could either be warriors or criminals. More so leaning to criminals, though, with the wolf. But there's one end goal for their transformation. Carnage. They're out for blood. These wolves were fully engulfed in their own primal urges, pretty much. But in the story of Sigmunder and Sinfjolti, the two voluntarily donned the pelts that transformed them into wolves. The father and son embarked on their own journey, facing their own darkness, in order to gain control of it. They gained wisdom after confronting their own hunger, greed, and aggression. And they completed a step in mastering these feelings. Right? So, lesson learned, but it's more confrontational instead of letting it consume you. Mastering it. Gaining control over those things. But yeah, let's hit the last and least obvious. We've got the romantic wolf. This wolf is more so a victim of the greed and aggression. And let me, I also want to put a side note about the women in these stories, because I see that as symbolic to their alter egos women had to create in those times, you know, because they weren't able to openly express themselves. So in turn, they had to be deceptive in order to get anything they actually wanted out of life. But okay, back to the romantic wolf. In these stories, that wolf is uh, more so self-aware, or should I say a self-aware wolf? <laughs> okay, um, but... This victim, you know, is involuntarily transformed into a wolf, but he still manages to hold on to some of his humanity, you know, and tries to suppress the urges, which was not always successful. The betrayed wolf, although he didn't want to harm anyone, still retained the same animal aggression, only it would manifest when provoked or triggered, similar to PTSD, which can occur after heartbreak and betrayal, as these wolves experienced. So I'm tempted to rant about how relative the werewolf is to certain mental illnesses, and how these stories may have helped people understand or stigmatize certain mental illnesses in this time, but I think that's also for another report. The story of the werewolf has probably existed as long as man has been able to tell stories, and through stories like these we have been able to learn more about different aspects of ourselves, as well as be entertained for thousands of years, which I find pretty cool. 
Whew, slap me silly and call me Pepe Sylvia because that research was a doozy and it got me feeling dizzy. But I, I mean, I hope I've been able to relay some of my takeaway in a grounded and informative manner. And I just want to say peace, love, and ow. And now Lucy Bond with her impersonation of an Icelandic werewolf. Okay, friends, slather on the Nutella. It's time for Book Corner with Brie and Dan. Today on Book Corner with Brie and Dan, Brie Litterall reviews Lucas Magnum's novel, Saint Sadist, and Dan Rosendale reviews Alex Cassimi's Pop Magic. Let's check in with Brie first for a look at Lucas Magnum's Saint Sadist. Rob? Rob, can you hear me? Hey, it's your metallurgic prophet here, Brie Litterall. Today, I'll be doing a review of the book Saint Sadist by Lucas Mangum. Now, before I get into this, I do need to do a bit of a trigger warning. This book contains very sensitive themes, and the themes include the following. Domestic violence, sexual assault, sexual violence, death, torture, language, and other violence in general. That being said, this book is definitely worth the read. Saint Sadist is the story of a girl named Courtney who grew up in a traditional Christian household with a drunk, abusive father and a complicit mother. At 12, the abuse escalated, and by 19, she found out she was pregnant with her father's child. Determined to get away and to make a better life for not only herself but her unborn baby, she runs. And she runs right into the arms of charismatic doomsday cult leader, Ambrose. Now, his cult is a sort of mix of Christian religion and environmental values. Courtney's journey is a harrowing and painful one, but it's also beautiful and empowering. I'm not going to lie to you. This book is brutal. But that brutality is part of its charm. And I know that sounds weird, but just hear me out. Lucas Mangum has this way of writing that's very straightforward and to the point when he's talking about these atrocious things that are happening. And he doesn't beat around the bush. He doesn't sugarcoat it. He doesn't use these extravagant words to cover up any of it. He just puts it in front of you, plain and simple, where you're forced to confront it and acknowledge it. And... I think that's wonderful. I think it plays perfectly into the themes of this book. I mean, he manages to use the ideas of the power of sex in society and faith in religion, and he develops this character that uses both of those things to not only survive, but to take her victimization and to not let it belittle her or bring her down. Instead, she uses it as fuel to survive the horrible things she goes through in this book from start to finish this book has you on the edge of your seat you just want to keep reading and then when you get to the end i was speechless but i finally understood what the title meant and i was in awe i loved this book i would recommend this to anybody who is interested in reading it It is amazing, and I love it so much. I mean, it gave me chills. The whole time I was reading it, I had goosebumps. If you are of appropriate age and this sort of thing doesn't trigger you too much, um, it is something to be mindful of going into reading this book. But otherwise, I say go for it. It's great. I love it. I hope you love it too. So I think that's about it for my review. I'm going to hand everything back over to Rob, and I'll see you guys later. Bye. And now Dan Rosendale, taking a look at Alex Kazemi's Pop Magic. I think my watch is right. Let's 
see. It's about that time. Oh. Rob, can you hear me? Rob, oh, Rob, I've managed to align a spare camera lens with the morning sun and place it exactly at the center of my room. I had to break out a ruler for this thing, man. You're really stretching me. I now hopefully speak to you using the power of geography and the sun. Today you've sent me Pop Magic by Alex Kazemi. Here's what I have to say about it. Pop Magic functions as a sort of introductory guide to the mysteries of magic and stakes its purpose on a mission to change. Change being a loaded word here. Author Alex Kazemi means to change a lot through his book. He means to change the social stigma surrounding magical practice. He means to normalize the abstract and invite the reader to get weird and explore their magical capabilities. He does this through incredibly brief overviews of a vast variety of magical practices, ranging from basic things that are more self-help than magical to extreme mental and emotional odysseys that are incredibly subjective and rely heavily on personal experience and perspective. For context, pop magic contains a bizarre gradient from things like meditation and positive thinking to angelic binary communication and a complete Illuminati manifesto containing 22 rules aimed at, you guessed it, freeing ourselves from the quote-unquote simulation. If you're looking for concrete practice or anything concise in general, this book is not for you. Kazemi writes like he's trying to meet a word count, and defines the effectiveness of magical practice in frustratingly vague means. He places the responsibility of results on the reader, freeing himself of any real accountability. Kazemi describes various methods of magical practice in deviously open ways, so as to ride everything, accountability, results, and effectiveness, on empty promises, misguided personal experiences, and meaningless celebrity cosigns. Speaking of cosigns, Kazemi can't seem to escape this annoying air of narcissistic, pretentious righteousness. He seems to spend just as much, if not more, time talking about his success, his connections, and his ability to seemingly warp his reality and cheat life using magic. This is fine, I suppose, because it's your book, man. Write what you want, but... What he sweeps under the carpet are his fishy industry connections, Goldilocks opportunities, and suburban privileges that allowed him to rise to the bizarre place he is now. Listeners may be surprised to hear that the main supporters of Pop Magic include Oprah Winfrey, Bella Thorne, Selena Gomez, and Marilyn Manson. Completely normal, relatable people that could never have their magical results skewed by their unique personal lifestyles. Kazemi is blatantly fishing for attention and support from his two target audiences. One, uninformed and impressionable adolescents, and two, uninformed and impressionable celebrities. Look, I commend Kazemi on his efforts to educate the masses about an objectively complex and strange world of knowledge and understanding. Pop magic is meant to be a starting point, and that's great, but the moment we begin to take ourselves too seriously, as this book would have us do, is the moment we resign our ability to remain fluid. Kazemi is right in pointing you in a great direction, one of success, self-love, sacrifice, and patience. But he arms you with the wrong mindset and tools, unfortunately. Believing in magic is wonderful, and by all means, go for it. It transcends the mundane and seasons our life with wonder, but please don't expect it to get you that job or save your relationship. These things have been, and will continue to be up to you, my friends. Thanks for sending in the book, Rob. Special thanks today to Darren Ward, uh, who provided our Icelandic werewolf's tale, and also the graphic that we are using uh, for this image, uh, as you find it on the internet in places other than Spotify or iTunes, which do not use images. Uh, now it's time for our Order of Confessors. I'm going to go ahead and gong that on open. Let's start with Axe Stain, who is uplifted. Yes, Axe Stain, uh, it has been a little while since you've posted that review. Uh, 10 out of 10 from you, and we appreciate it. Uh, so we are glad to finally give you that shout out. Also, David P., who actually owns a copy of the Biographical Dictionary of American Cult and Sect Leaders, Emily R., our intrepid janitor who is working her way through the wild world of COVID. I've had a couple of exchanges with Emily, delightful human being, and so glad to hear from her on Facebook. And Tiffany, or Tiffany, 
RP, a pagan interested in things Christian who likes the skits. Thanks, Tiffany. Thanks to all of you. Uh, I've got to be honest. <laughs> we, we field uh, some 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 uh, some troll uh, traffic <laughs> out there in the wide wide world of occult confessing. When you put your material out there, and uh, when you have as much uh, personality as this podcast does, uh, there are going to be some folks who uh, weigh in with. Uh, let's just say, uh, less than loving thoughts. Uh, and so folks who take the time to, to write a few kind words, uh, it makes a great big difference. Uh, when folks do find the podcast, they check, uh, many people do check the reviews. And, and if that top review is, is something positive, I think that helps pull people in to have a listen. And, and if it's uh, something trolling us, uh, then, then I think it might scare some folks away. So it's uh, awfully nice uh, to hear from you folks and to hear from everyone uh, who has taken the time to write uh, to us and, and write about us. Uh, over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, and so that, that's it. We're going to close up the order of confessors. Uh, and since I'm all, all alone here uh, with, with me, with my, my antennae, uh, I am going to uh, go ahead and uh, adjourn and declare close this meeting of the secret order of alchemical actors until such a time as we get together and do it again. We were joined today by our contingent of alchemical actors who have all been acknowledged in turn as we have made our way through today's events. Uh, so I gotta get over uh, to these antenna and get them the heck out of my backyard so that my uh, my kid doesn't end up hurting herself on one of these uh, bizarre uh, pieces of statuary that I've, I've uh, erected. Uh, and, and you all uh, can feel free to go about your lives resting assured uh, that we are back on track and we will be podcasting uh, back on our regular schedule every other Friday. Uh, where you find your podcasts. When we return, uh, we will be completing our uh, conspiracy series. Uh, not in an episode, uh, but in a four, we have four more episodes uh, to bring that uh, finally to a close. Uh, and we're going to be uh, starting with the uh, our episode on Luciferian sleeper cells, uh, where we discover uh, secret Lucifer worshippers in the ranks of the Catholic Church and the Freemasons. I look forward to speaking with you all next time here on Occult Confessions.